When the first rock struck Walid's back, he turned immediately to look behind him to find out who had just thrown that rock. And he shouted out at the people there standing there, no one which was taking responsibility. Shopkeepers turned their eyes from him. The men standing on the street acted like they didn't know what he was talking about as he yelled, who threw that rock? No one claimed. As he didn't turn his back to continue to walk in the direction he was going, rocks began to pelt his back again. This time he did not look back because the barrage of rocks was so much it was damaging him, it was hurting him, it was bruising him, and he ran for his life. Finally arriving at his destination of safety, while he began to examine the damage to his body and realizing the brothers that he once claimed were his brothers in the mosque that he once was at no longer were his brothers. They had turned on him. And simply because he wanted to know who was this Jesus that the Quran had talked about 187 times, more than any other person in the Quran, who was this Jesus? He was simply asking questions to get an answer. But the questions were not allowed. And he was rejected. Walid grew up in a family where he was determined at a very young age that he would be an Islamic scholar. And he was groomed accordingly and taught Arabic extensively and taught the Quran thoroughly to the point at which he was then later sent to Mecca in Saudi Arabia for a four-year scholarship at the university where he would be taught in all the ways of Islam, graduating, even becoming a sheikh, wearing white and becoming a teacher in the Islamic religion respected greatly. He was doing it all quite wonderfully and well, recommended and commended by others of his knowledge of the Quran, his faithful devotion, but then something happened in his life he did not expect. He was diagnosed with cancer. And after not one, not two, not three, but four unsuccessful surgeries, the doctor told Walid, there's nothing more that could be done for you. You're going to die. Faced with this reality of his pending death and knowing that Islam did not offer him the certainty of forgiveness as every Quran-believing Islam understands, he hoped that the ledger of his good deeds would outweigh his bad deeds. And so to assure himself of that, he literally, at the mosque that he was a teacher at, moved into the mosque to the point at which he would actually send people to get food for him so that no point would he have to leave the mosque and encounter any other kind of temptation outside of the mosque. And in doing so, he read over and over and over and over again. And he was fascinated by what he read. Confused though as well. His confusion was because he wanted to know more about this Jesus. And the questions that he asked about Jesus were unacceptable. Finally, he knew of no other place to go except he remembered hearing that there was a story he had heard from another person from long ago of somebody named Philip talking to a eunuch from Ethiopia who, after believing in Jesus, went back to Ethiopia. So Walid, in 2007, hearing a 2,000-year-old story, got on a plane and flew to Ethiopia. And he literally thought, I will go to the first building that I can find in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, that has a cross, and I will ask people, someone please tell me who this Jesus is. To his surprise and disappointment, not understanding the Coptic church that's now rampant in the country of Ethiopia, he went into church after church for three days and no one would answer for him. The most he would get would be an invitation to church on a Sunday. After three days of great discouragement, he finally just kind of gave up. He went to a movie, was sitting in a movie waiting for it to begin, began to talk to somebody seated next to him, to which the person realized this man is here from Saudi Arabia in order that he might learn about Jesus. Jesus. And took him to a gathering of Christians where they could begin to take him through the Bible and show him who is Jesus. And to his 
mind-blowing reality, he began to understand what his mind had never understood before. Jesus was the son of God. He was not just a prophet, as Islam had stated. He was indeed the son of God, resurrected from the grave. And Walid believed. And he gave his life to Christ. Because he had been raised in Islam and because he had become so well educated in it, he began to understand the opportunity God had given him to reach Muslims with the background. His background with a sheik religious background as an Islamic cleric, he knew so much about Islam, he'd committed so many of his days to be able to lead other fellow Muslims to an understanding of who actually Jesus was, to be converted to Christianity themselves and began to meet with others who follow Christ. One woman named Yasmina, whose ex-husband had abandoned her and divorced her when she became a believer, although he never expected to marry, Walid and Yasmina eventually married, thankful that God had given each other in marriage to one another, to which he says, I am doing so much better now with my wife than I am without. Goes on to speak of the days in which he was well known and now, not only well-known for being Islamic devotee, but now being well-known as someone who had abandoned Islam and was being chased and hunted and pelted with rocks to crush him. To which he says, you know, life is very short. The only thing we have to do is to share God's power with our people who are dying without Christ. We cannot see them and keep silent. The story of Walim is captivating, but it's not unique. As I speak to you today, as you sit here in the comfort of this room, in this church in the city of Miami, the United States of America, there are countless people around the world who once were enemies of Christ, but now, to their own surprise, are now devoted followers of Christ and are willing to lay down their life so that others who otherwise intend to kill them would come to know Christ. Friends, these stories abound, and they certainly are seen in the scriptures as well. To do that together, let's turn to the book of Galatians, where we see such a captivating an account. It's not only captivating to learn, but it's also humbling. Because we'll learn in the book of Galatians chapter 1, Specifically in our text this morning, verse 11 through verse 24, God is at the work of saving sinners. And no one is more surprised by that than the very people he is saving. Some of you know this story already because it's your story. It's not just Waleem's story, it's not just Paul's story, it's your story. And this morning will perhaps take you down memory lane as you even hear the story of another for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, we are waking, making our way through the book of Galatians. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul, a messenger of God, sent by God to the people in different parts of the country, around the country, to be able to give them the understanding of the gospel. And this is the churches in South Galatia, kind of in the Mediterranean region, if you will. We pick up where we left off in our previous verses. We've gone through verses one through 10 in the previous three weeks. Now this morning we come to chapter one, verse 11, through the end of our chapter. And if you would, just follow along as I read verses 11 and 12. Paul writes, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Friends, in these two verses, we really get to the heart, if you will, of what Paul has been talking about and will continue to talk about really as a major theme through the first two chapters of the book of Galatians. And it really is this contention, this discussion, this debate, if you will, that nothing left in heaven and hell is on the line, and that is what is the gospel and where did it come from? You go back to Galatians chapter one, verse one. Notice what Paul says there by way of reminder. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. 
Paul, in a very similar way now, is not only citing his own relationship to God and to them as an apostle, he now in verses 11, 12, is citing the relationship of the gospel. He's like, listen, the gospel is God's good news, not man's good news. It's not created by men, it's not given by a man, it is indeed from God himself. You could say that the main point, if you're taking notes this morning, or just to kind of capture the main point of our text, is gonna be this. The gospel is a divine declaration, not a human creation. The gospel is a divine declaration, not a human creation. This should already perhaps be head-turning for some of you who perhaps are here today investigating Christianity. You're not investigating the teachings of men, though they were written by men, you're investigating the teachings of God. What does God's word say about God's world, particularly for you who's made in God's image? And we see this in verse 11 and 12. Look at what he's saying here. The gospel is not of man, right? Back to verse one, not from men nor through man, Back to verse 11, it says, but you have known, brothers, that the gospel is preached to me is not man's gospel. What's he saying here? The gospel is not compiled by any human authority, reasoning, or logic. But also, it's not only not of man, it's also not from man. Look at verse 12. What he says here, for I did not receive it from any man. Significance here is that the gospel is communicated to Paul by none other than Jesus Christ. And Paul now begins to go on to a biographical sketch of his life and what God has done in his life to bring to bear on the message. And friends, this is significant because I want to make sure you understand a point we've made in previous Sundays. And this is this. The gospel is not measured based on the messenger, but based on the message. And Paul's like, if you want to talk about the messenger, you want to talk about me, let me just set the record straight. And you don't just have to listen to me. There's a lot of other people you can listen to as well who have something to say about they're as shocked as I am that I'm a messenger, but it illustrates not how good of a messenger I am, but how profound of a life-saving truth the message is. Now, from verses 13 and following, he gives three convincing truths that the gospel came from God. Three convincing truths that the gospel came from God. The first one is in Paul's BC testimony. Look at verse 13 and 14. He says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with a little bit of history here, we often today in history mark events as to A.D. and B.C. It might interest some of you, the historical people to just realize this, that the very nature of A.D., that is a very dating concept. It did not really come until the 500s of what we refer to today as the 500s by actually a monk as he wanted to provide an alternative way of measuring time based on all the different ways in which countries around the world measured it, especially based on Roman emperors and things like this. And so in 500, he introduced the idea of AD. AD is Latin for ad hominem, which is Latin for the idea of in the year of our Lord. BC, interestingly, which stands for before Christ, was not introduced until about 200 years later, and it wasn't until about the year 1000 that this became a popular way of dating society and humanity. Today, it's uncommon, AD and BC. Though you'll often hear sometimes people today, particularly in professors in academic classes, they'll, they'll try to change it up, ADE, BCE, before common era. What do these things mean? We're talking about all of human history revolving around the reality when did Jesus come? When was he born? Before Christ, everything in history before him, kind of backing up in negative count, and everything since him. But that's at a historical level. But do you know that at a personal level, people can perhaps even refer to their own testimony like this? 
Perhaps if you're not a Christian and you're sometimes get around Christians and their vocabulary, they might have different sort of Christian jargon. You're like, I don't know what they're talking about. Bless up. I don't know what that meant. I'm just out here just trying to, you know, bless her heart. You're like, what's wrong with her heart? Well, nothing. Well, something is, but I talk like that. It's weird like that. Sometimes Christians will use the phrase BC. For those of you who are not Christians, they're referring to their life before Christ. Their life before Christ. Some of you are blessed to be raised in Christian households. And not that that guaranteed that you came to faith in an early age, but some of you did. Praise God. Others of you, you don't have Christian moms or dads, Christian grandparents. You are the first Christian in your entire family. And perhaps you maybe didn't get saved until much later in life, maybe your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And you can look back at your life before you came to Christ and you can think about, man, if you knew the things I did, it would make any preacher blush. Well, I'm a preacher and I would say, you'd be surprised, it takes me a lot to blush. I've kind of heard it all and seen it all. Paul, he's giving his BC testimony here, verse 13 and 14. He talked about what life was like for him. Verses 13 and 14 is a condensed version of what, you, what I want you to see in the book of Acts. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. You're like, where's Acts? Go to the left in your Bibles. You're in Galatians. You're not far from it. <clears throat> Go to Acts chapter 8. Let's meet Paul before he was a Christian. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts. This is Luke's record of the earliest days of the church since the ascension of Jesus Christ. Paul was firmly known as the man named Saul, not Paul. Look at Acts chapter eight, verse one. And Saul approved of his execution. Whose execution? The stoning of Stephen, in the earlier in chapter seven. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul, verse 3, was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Jump ahead to chapter 9. Look with me at verse 1. But Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them to be bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what, we are, what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank goes on to speak of his conversion in verses 10 and following. But now, jump ahead, if you would, to Acts chapter 26. Saul, who has been renamed Paul, speaks in a sermon about his testimony. Chapter 26. Look with me, if you would, at verse 4 and 5. Acts chapter 26 as he is speaking to Agrippa, the king, he says in verse four, my manner of life from my youth, spent from the very beginning among my own nation in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Jump down to verse nine. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. 
And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme in raging fury against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from, the, from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Friends, you might think, and perhaps even right now sit here as a non-Christian think, There's no way God could love me and forgive me of what I've done. I don't know what you've done. How many women or men you've slept with? How many lines of coke you've done? How many crimes you've committed? How much time you've served in jail? I I don't know what you've done. Paul has blood on his hands. People are dead because of Paul. People have lost their wives and their husbands because of Paul. People have lost their parents because of Paul. People are orphans because of Paul. Paul says, there's no one more shocked than me, Paul says. That this is the gospel that I'm preaching. Because this gospel, I hated. And I hated anyone who taught it. Paul's testimony is a radical display of God's grace. I mean, in verse 13, back to Galatians chapter one, verse 13, Paul's talking about his cruelty to Christians. You look at what he says there in verse 13 of chapter one of of Galatians. For you have received in my former life how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. I mean, he was a pharisaical thug. He was full-on Jewish gangster. He wanted to do anything he could to eradicate it and believed he was zealous. And even as he makes a reference passing earlier in verse 10, he did it for the pleasure of others, not just the pleasing of God. In verse 14, he talks about his, not only his cruelty in verse 13, verse 14 talks about his commitment towards Judaism. He had a resume that would impress any Pharisee. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. He would be the one that parents would say, why can't you be more like Paul? He's an overachiever at a young age. His overachieving was trying to stamp out the gospel and kill anybody who would claim to believe in it. Now, why is this a convincing truth that the gospel came from God? Because it didn't come from Paul. It didn't come from Paul. He is headed on a highway to hell, bringing everybody he can with him to go there. And God, in his mysterious grace, comes to him on the Damascus road and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting You know what Jesus says? Why are you persecuting me? He wasn't persecuting Jesus. He's persecuting Christians. Oh, friend, this is fascinating because Jesus identifies himself with his people. To persecute Christians is to persecute Jesus. Jesus identifies himself with the church. Those are my people, Jesus says. But what's so radical about God's grace is God does not do what we can imagine many people would pray. What happened? What would we perhaps pray for Paul if he's coming after? God, stop him and end his life. 
Would evildoers be judged by you? God, these people are satanic. That's exactly what Saul says himself in the sermon in Acts 26 to King Agrippa. People who are following after Satan's desires. You would think, God, I think it feels righteous to pray this. God's like, I'm not only not gonna kill him and judge him, I'm actually gonna save him and send him. Now, friend, if you need a little pep talk, there it is. What God can do with a radical sinner like Paul he can do in your and my life as well. Which takes us to the second convincing truth that the gospel came from God. It's not only Paul's BC testimony. Secondly, it's God's sovereign work and timing. This will be mind-blowing. Look at verse 15. He sets us up, this contrast, with verse 15. But, but, when he, who is he? It's God. When he who had set me apart before I was born, what? And who called me by his grace, verse 16, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia, Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Friends, if you want to know what sovereign grace looks like, this is it. This is sovereign grace. Now, this is mind-blowing because of what it says here. He says here, God had set me apart before I was born? This sounds strikingly similar to what we read in the book of Romans. Romans chapter eight says the following in verse 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I literally just read the Bible to you. That is radical work. Because here's often how you and I think about our salvation. Keeping your finger in the book of Galatians, turn to one book to the right. Go to the book of Ephesians. Literally, like, it's just like probably a page or two turning in your Bible. Go to Ephesians chapter one. Now look with me at Ephesians chapter one, verse 13. Verse 13 says, in him, this is Christ. He's talking to the church in Ephesus. In him, you these Christians in Ephesus, in him, so in Christ, you Christians in Ephesus, also, when you heard the word of truth, so some was evangelizing them, some was preaching them, some was telling the gospel, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who was the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And for most people, understandably, because of like your own awareness of kind of autobiographical identity, when you tell your story, your testimony, you have kind of a verse 13 and 14 testimony. Well, hey, I was living like this, and then God used these people, these providences to bring the gospel to me. I believed in it, and because I believed in it, I was saved by just the remarkable reality, given the Holy Spirit, and I live now by the power of the Spirit until Christ returns. True, true but you like left off a massive part of the testimony. Verses 13 and 14 actually is one long statement Paul says. Indulge me. Look at verse three. This is actually where Paul begins the whole point. It's actually one long run-on sentence in the Greek when he writes this. He says the following, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. 
In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. That's why he does this. With which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse seven, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. And all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, all things in heaven and things on earth. In him, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And then here's our verses. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who was the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Friends, I'm not gonna lie. I'm 21 years old, not now, a little bit older. 21 years old, reading this passage for the first time, and I have got all kinds of questions. Maybe you've got them yourself right now. That's what Q&As are for, by the way. I've made no comments about it. I've just read the text. This is a regular repeating theme of God's sovereign grace that though mysterious is nevertheless real. How do sinners get saved? How do persecutors get commissioned to be apostles? Because of God's mysterious sovereign work. I mean, he goes on to talk in Ephesians chapter two about their own testimony, verses one to three of Ephesians two, But then in verse four of Ephesians two, it says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, verse six, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ, verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Friends, when you see Paul's testimony in Galatians 1, you can be reminded of your testimony in Ephesians 1. God has done a radical work in every Christian's life to bring them to the point at which they have entrusted Christ. We know this. This is why every Christian prays to God for the salvation of other people. Because we believe this. If we didn't believe this, why would we be praying? What would we be saying to God? Hey, God, I've got this coworker. God, I've got this wife. God, I've got this husband. God, I've got this son. I've got this daughter. I've got this sibling. God, please do what I cannot do. We pray with urgency and earnestly for God to do the same thing with others that he did with us, give blind, give sight to the blind, give hearing to the deaf, give healing to the lame, that those are once dead would be, according to Ephesians 2, made alive. And this gives us confidence when we evangelize. God loves to save sinners. It's remarkable to see. Now, when you look at Paul's testimony here in Galatians 1, he marvels at this reality in other contexts, in other texts, rather. But here he just gets to the point, why did God do this work in his life? He was pleased, verse 16, to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Have you ever wondered and thought, well, I'm not called to be an apostle. If you've thought that, I would say you're right. If you have thought that, that you've been called to be an apostle, I'd say you're wrong. No matter what your mom or dad, you can do whatever you want to do. You can't be an apostle. 
probably can't be an NBA star, and you can't be an apostle. It's not possible. But you might think, well, if I'm not called to be an apostle, does God have the same work in my life? God does have the same purpose and plan in your life. His plan for you, though not being an apostle, is the same way that life, but Paul's life was to be an ambassador. Do you know that for some of you, you will be the only regular repeating Christian that some people in your life will have ever known their entire life? And if they bring things up about your life that they know, you used to party with us. You used to do crazy things. You go to these clubs with us. You're like, I know, I know. Trust me, I know. I'm tempted, I'm tempted to not say anything to you about Jesus because I know that you might be thinking what I'm thinking, which is I wasn't so Jesus-oriented, you know, three months ago before I was a Christian, three years ago before I was a Christian. You remember me of those family reasons. I get that. I just want to say Christianity is filled with a long line of people who are like, I know. I know what it's like to live life before Christ. And by God's grace, I know what it's like to be forgiven by God of my sin and be made a new creature in Christ and desire for others to know the same grace that he has shown me. And I want you to know that. Because things that you know about me, I don't think you know the full story about me. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. I want you to know the full story. Which takes us to our third convincing truth. Independent affirmation, not consultation. Independent affirmation, not consultation. Look at it, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. It's another name for Peter. Like you got Saul, Paul, you got Cephas, you got Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, and what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Verse 21, then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, he who used, to per, who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. I trust that sometime in your life when you went to apply for a job, they asked for references. Have you worked anywhere? Does anybody know you? Are you related to anybody? Have you had any place of employment? Can we get their names, their addresses, their phone numbers? We'd like to talk to them about you, please. And you're like, oh my. This could go well, this might not go well. One of my proudest moments, please read sarcasm in that, of my employment history was working at a health food store in Fort Lauderdale. Kind of before Whole Foods was around, there was this health food store. It's crazy, wild. Before everybody got in the health food store. I was cool before you guys were. I was the produce manager at a health food store. My wife still can't believe that to this day because of how much I'm not known for eating fruits and vegetables unless she serves them to me. I got fired from that job. Not for persecution. Not for evangelizing too much. I got fired because I was an irresponsible college kid who was too busy staying up late to come into work on time, if at all, calling in sick. You know, rumble in my tummy. I wouldn't want to get others sick. And my manager fired me. I said, you can't fire me. Like, I can, and I will, and I just did. You're fired. Let's just say when I went to apply for my next job, I didn't put that guy's phone number down to contact. I don't want people to know that part of my story. Paul is giving people in the geographic locations of where they are to validate his story here. Paul's like, what I'm saying to you is not because I was parroting somebody else, but I was seen by other people. You'll notice in his timeline here how he references. Verse 15, he says, but when he had set me And then in verse 18, then after three years, verse 21, then I went to the regions of Syria. Paul was on the move, but not to places and with people that you would expect. 
Paul wasn't trying to please the crowd as we saw earlier last week in verse 10. He wasn't trying to please people. He was trying to please God, who he was a slave of, a slave of Christ, a servant of Christ. But nevertheless, he gives references. He talks about, hey, go talk to Peter in verse 18. He can tell you I was there. Talk to James. He can tell you I was there. And then talk to the other people. I, they didn't see me, but they heard about me. And they'll tell you themselves. This could only be a work of God because that guy that we've heard about with our hearing, we've now seen the effect of his ministry. People are getting saved because of his preaching. That can only be explained because the gospel is God's, not man. And he has done this work. Even look at what it says there in verse 24. They glorified God because of me. Some of you know the author, J.K. Rowling, author of the well-known series, Harry Potter series of books. Do you know she makes about $100 million a year? Per year. Her net worth right now is estimated at one billion dollars. But not everybody knows where she came from. She describes herself in one article as basically having a common or garden bookworm kind of personality as a child, complete with freckles and spectacles. Reading and writing fiction were heavy influences on her childhood while she lived in rural England. She wasn't even in London or some other well-known city. Her childhood was marked by her mother's illness and a strained relationship with her father. She would later, as an adult, was working as a researcher and a bilingual secretary for Amnesty International when she conceived the idea for the Harry Potter series while on a delayed train from Manchester to London. During that seven-year period of when she would write, it followed the death of her mother, the birth of her first child, the divorce from her first husband, and lived on food stamps in Edinburgh, Scotland. When she finally wrote the book, she submitted to publishers and it was rejected not one, not two, but 12 times before it was finally published. It's a rags to riches story. An origin story that you would think, who would have thought? It's remarkable. But it's highly attractive. I'd like to have that be my story, wouldn't you? I was nobody, now I'm somebody. I was poor, now I make $100 million a year. Poor Eric, he's struggling. Paul's story is a different kind of origin story. Because he went from being highly regarded, greatly loved, widely received, to being hunted and persecuted himself. Who would have thought? For those of you who are not in Christ, I said this last week and it's still true. What Jesus says in Luke 9 is true. Whoever wants to be my disciple, he says, must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Paul said, I will follow you, Lord, wherever you lead. Because only in you can I find the same thing that Walid understood himself as an Islamic cleric. Only in Christ can I find forgiveness. Can I know peace and the hope of eternal life. And be glad to exchange that for everything else could possibly be given. Because in the end, everything else will end with no significance in eternity. So friend, the question for you is, to whom will you live for? And to what will you pray for in the lives of others? Paul says, it's not my gospel, it's God's. And for you as a Christian, that's exactly what you're saying to your friends. It's not my good news, it's God's, of his son for you, dying on the cross as a substitute that whoever would turn from his sins and put their faith alone in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins would be granted eternal life, adopted as a child, justified and declared righteous, and dwell with the Holy Spirit as a pledge of your inheritance and promise no matter what happens, nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ. That's a promise God makes and a promise he keeps.
and the promise that Paul preaches, and I hope you would as well.